it's just a, a remarkable contrast where you have basically one political party that cares nothing about the system, cares nothing about the law, cares nothing about the Constitution, cares nothing about justice, but only cares about supporting one man who is irretrievably demented and depraved and is now a convicted felon in addition to being an adjudicated rapist and fraudster. Hello, everyone, and welcome to George Conway Explains It All to Sarah. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and because I'm not a lawyer, that's my good friend George Conway <laughs> from the Society for the Rule of Law to come explain the legal news to me. George, one week since conviction, how are you feeling? I feel 34 times better than usual. That's good. That's good. I'm excited exactly to hear it. Exactly 34. Not 33, not 35, but 34 times better than usual. Okay. And it's I a specific number. Good. Yeah, 34. Yeah. Uh, it's my favorite number. When we did the emergency pod. I think I'm going to fly to Vegas and just sort of put all my 34? money on 34 for a while. Okay. Yeah. Lucky number. Yeah. When we did the emergency pod right after the conviction, you were very like, yeah, guys, I told you this was going to happen. I did. Uh, and you there still. Is vi- there is videographic and audio evidence that. I did say this was going to happen. Yeah, so you were pretty, like, circumspect. You weren't jumping up and down. You weren't excited. Mm-hmm. Did you win? You win any bets with people? Did yes, you- I did win a bet. I won a bet. Um, I, I've never met him, but um, I occasionally correspond with Mark Cuban uh, on uh, X or whatever. by DMs. And, and he said a few weeks ago, I think it was April, April, mid-April, and I'd forgotten about this, uh, he said he thought there was going to be a hung jury no matter what. And I said... No, juries don't really hang that often. I mean, it's possible you can get a MAGA type, but this is a this was I had just watched the jury selection. I thought this was a pretty good Manhattan jury, and I didn't see any ringers. And it's really hard to hang a jury anyway. I think I probably said that in the last few weeks. Yeah, um, you really have to you have to really be out there and willing to basically take the abuse of eleven people who you are disagreeing with you. And I said, I don't think it was, it's going to hang. I think he's going to go down. Um, and that was before some of the evidence came in and. He goes, oh, I'd bet any amount of money So on that. And, of course, you don't want to bet any amount of money with Mark Cuban. So um, he said a dollar. And I said, and I said, uh, and, and then he said dinner. And fine. So he owes me a meal. Well, I hope he takes you somewhere very nice. Yeah. I mean, you I'm actually nice going time. up. I'm going up to, to see uh, on my own dime. I was going up to see Celtics Mavericks game on Sunday. And, and maybe maybe he can get me lunch there or something. I don't know. I, I, I'll, I, want, I just want to meet the guy. It'd yeah, cool. sure. Okay. And to say I was right. I mean, I, I, I might, that might make dinner like less enjoyable yeah, I don't know. for maybe, him. Well, maybe, maybe like maybe, tone it down yeah, like no, a notch. I, I guess those will go, my free, my free Mavericks tickets will go out the door next year. For, okay, that's fine. So uh, since, since the verdict, <laughs> Republicans have been on just a tear. They are yeah. like rending garments, you know, clutching pearls. The, the, we live in a banana republic. Yeah. The judicial system has yeah, failed entirely. Yeah, meanwhile, entirely. They're, 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 no, they're, trying to, they're trying to elect the chief banana, put him back. Yeah. But yeah, okay, you know, we live in a banana republic. So what do you make of the Republican response to this? I am running out of words to express disgrace and contempt and vileness and mendacity to describe these people. You've still I got mean, a few words. Those are lots of words. There's just mm-hmm. no good words to describe it. I mean, these people... I mean, first of all, they're they're enormous hypocrites because if a Democrat had ever had ever done one tenth of what one fiftieth of what Trump has done, or zero, as we can show by, you know, their continual ranting and raving about the Biden crime family, they would be they would be up in arms and they would be pro- they would be praising these prosecutions, and then you know they're just lying. They're just lying about the they're lying about the facts. They're lying about the law. They're ignoring. You know, the fact that there was a fair jury trial, you can't even get them to talk about what happened. I mean, if you ask um, Speaker Johnson, I think they tried to ask him, well, you know, what, what this, this bit about the porn star and the hush money, you want to tell us what you think of that? And he's, mm, no, 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 no. You know, they can't, they, it's, it, they, they just refuse to engage on the merits and they just, you know, they lie about everything and they lie about, the, they, they contend that the charges weren't grounded in law. They contend that the, the jury didn't know what it was supposed to be convi- you know, convicting on. And it was just it's like, no, this was a pretty simple, clear case at the end of the day. And the only reason why it was relative, you, re, what, what, why it's unique and kind of unusual is because of its unusual facts and involves an unusual defendant. But the, but the legal theory that you, uh, um, you know, the legal 
basis, which is that you can't falsify records in New York and that it's a felony when you do it to cover up another crime is, you know, they've, it's been applied in any number of contexts. You just, you know, this is just an unusual context in the sense that how many presidential candidates are dumb enough to pay off a porn star to hush her up and they don't stay hushed and then engage in all of this incredible fraud, fraudulent documentation to cover it up. So uh, what, one of the things that has been kind of the central argument is everybody like on Twitter or what, they'll be like, what's the, what's the fundamental crime? What's the underlying crime? What's the, and so answer that. Well, the now, underlying just, crime, the crime is you cannot falsify business records in the state of New York. And that's and the, a felony? That's, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a at a minimum, it's a, it's a misdemeanor if it's set, if, if it's falsification of documents in the second degree. And if it's in the first degree, that's a felony, a class C felony. And what makes, you know, the, what, the, the dividing line between second degree falsification of documents and first degree falsification of documents is whether you were doing, what is your intent, whether you were doing it with the intent to cover up um, some other crime. And the crime or, is or, the or, FAC and not actually some, some other un, uh, illegality or uh, some other crime to solicit votes through unlawful means in the state of New York. And the unlawful means here was, uh, you know, there was a federal election campaign violation. There were tax violations. There was, you know, it, it just, it, this was designed to cover up election fraud. And that's, that's a pretty simple theory. And that's what was charged to the jury. And that's what they found. And there was no question about it because you had this guy who was basically, he, 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 he wanted to pay off Stormy Daniels, $130,000. He managed to do it through using a, a, a cutout, which is illegal under the Federal Election Campaign Act. And then they committed a tax violation be, to cover that up to make it look like it was something other than what it was, which was a reimbursement for a payoff. Um, they pretended it was income to him. So they committed tax fraud by engaging, you know, by pretending, by grossing up the amount. It was, you know, the kind of aggravated falsification of books and records that was exactly meant to fall within the purview of, of the, the first degree falsification of business prohibition. I saw you the falsification of business records prohibition. I saw you on CNN get like into it with Scott Jennings because he was what was his point was what I he, have to go back and remember but it was just he basically was the jury wasn't even charged wasn't even told what the underlying crime I forget exactly what it was but it was just outright false it was just outright false and it was just talking points straight from Mar-a-Lago mm. and and they all repeat this stuff and he's not a lawyer he had no idea what he was talking about and it was just you know they just spout out the lie of the day and that they all say it, they say, they all think they can just say the same things and just repeat it. And then it becomes fact. Uh, I, I just got tired of that. And I got tired of the fact that, you know, CNN is like paying for this. I mean, it's, I, I get that there are, I, I, you know, if I'm a running a network, I'm running a television show, I'm running a newspaper. I want to have opposing views, but when one side is continually just saying things that are untrue, unsupported in law, unsupported in fact, you know, uh, saying that this, 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 the trial was rigged, saying this, you're basically casting aspersions on the rule of law. You, you have to call that out. Yeah. Let, let me just, one of the things that I, it really strikes me, right? The way that the Republicans are talking about it is they're using language like rigged, right? It's a rigged jury or two-tier justice system. And it's amazing to me that basically any institution that we have in this country that has sought accountability for Donald Trump if it's the press, it's fake news. If it's, you know, the civil service or the FBI, they're the deep state. Uh, if it's an election, it's rigged. If it's a jury trial, it's, you know, now it's rigged or it's two-tier justice. Whatever. They, they basically tear down yeah, well, any institution that is meant to hold Trump accountable. And many of them, I mean, even cops, it's like cops try to you know, go after the January 6th. Uh, you know, insurrectionists, and now they're right. uh, they're the deep states. The January 6th committee, those are all rhinos uh, and Dems. Yeah. There is no institution that they will allow to hold Trump accountable, including the courts. Right. I mean, it's basically they are modeling Trump, and they, they, they you basically have an entire political party that models Trump, and you have millions of Americans who are now modeling Trump, and Trump is, you know, the ultimate example of a bad actor. And I, it reminds me, if you remember ever hearing the story that um, I think it was Leslie Stahl told about, you know, they, they were not on camera, but they were off camera at some and, and had a conversation where 
they were discussing why Trump always trashes the media. And he basically said, you know, one of these times when, when he's, he's, he can be honest when he's at his most malevolent. And Trump said to Leslie Stahl, you know, I trash you, I attack the media so that when they say bad things about me, no one will believe them. Yeah, I do remember that. And that is sort of, you can see, it's what he did. That's how we knew he was going to claim election fraud in 2020. He basically was prefacing it all year that this election's not going to be fair. Maybe we should put it off. Yeah. And he's, you know, he that's what he did at this trial. He knew he was going to lose. And the closer he got to the point of where he knew he was losing, the more he attacked the court. And... And that's what, you know, that basically he, he want, he will, it, it's him versus our institutions. It's him versus the truth. It's him versus reality. And he will basically trash everything in order to vindicate himself, in order to protect himself from consequences. And, you know, that, that the, 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 the thing that is the most horrifying about the last seven years is that they've got millions of people adhere to this mantra and you've got intelligent people educated people skilled professionals you know whether they be um you know members of congress or political consultants or commentators who just basically have accepted this as a way of life and that they have to go along with this and they go along with it trump could not do it alone he could not do he it without this could entire not do it alone. ecosystem and that's why you never right defense. and if you talk to me in 2017 i didn't have any idea that he was so bad right I and mean, you guys did um to your credit but i thought that even if he were that bad it he'd never get away with it because people would just say oh come on stop Dude, I, wrote, I remember this. One of the things that I just like is seared in my brain is the email that I wrote to my friends right after Trump was elected where I said, it's going to be OK. Republicans are serious people. They will not let him, you know, tear this country apart. But, like they will. Yeah. And for like a half a second with the Mueller investigation where they, you know, kept him from firing Mueller originally, I was like, see, like Republicans are kind of holding the line. And then one by one, whether it was Jeff Flake, whatever they were defenestrated from the party and ultimately everybody went along with it. Yeah, him. it's funny because it, that that went the opposite. What you were describing was what I believed would happen. I didn't think he was that, I didn't realize how bad he was, but I thought that if you were that bad, what you described is that sooner or later people would say stop. And exactly the opposite happened. It's sort of like, you know, nails on a chalkboard. I always, for me, it's like nails on a chalkboard, they just get worse and worse and I can't stand it more and more. These people got used to the nails That's on right. the chalkboard. They're, they're frogs in the pot, the boiling water. Yeah, yeah. frogs in the pot. For, yeah, yeah, you use the metaphor of your choice, but they got they got used to it. They decided yeah. they wanted to, you know, they wanted to sit there in the boiling pot. And then, the, the, I mean, there's the face face leopard metaphor. Yeah, got sure. All sorts of I never thought they'd eat my face. Yeah, at the sure. Head of Gee, the face yeah. leopard eating party. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, so I want to do something. Actually, uh, we we did a focus group like the day after the conviction. Uh, with two-time Trump voters, but these were voters who kind of were out on Trump after January 6th. They they really were not fans of him. And I want to play you some of, just a little bit of what they said. I, we did a whole episode for the Focus Group podcast this Saturday, which people should go listen to. Um, but I just want to give you a taste. I want criminals to go to jail. Like Bob Menendez is a Democrat from New Jersey, and he is being tried by Biden's DOJ because he's criminal. So uh, criminals should not be in charge. If they violate the laws, then they should be subject to exactly the same rules that all of us are expected to abide to. He should serve jail time, pay the penalty for the crime. We all know what's going to happen. They're going to negotiate and renegotiate. And I mean, he's not going to serve any time, but he'll get more time on television right here at the election time. All right. So that's just a couple sound bites, but there's two things in there I want to draw attention to. So the woman who said, I want criminals to go to jail, I would say from the two time Trump voters, uh, who are not very favorable toward him, they were all, they they sort of said they thought that the trial was politicized, but they also thought, hey, a jury heard all the evidence. They made the choice. I think it's good that he got convicted. I respect the decision and criminals should go to jail. That was like one genre of comments. Does that make you feel, how does that make you feel? Makes me feel good. Yeah. I like that. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, that's the ultimate test is whether or not the jury what the jury found, they weren't in the courtroom. They understand that, but they understand that if you, you know, 12 people picked at random, that's the basis for our system. That's the basis for our criminal justice system. And there was no basis 
on which to challenge this verdict as, as being unfair or unjust. And so they accept it. And that's what we are supposed to do as citizens. Now, if he has an argument for error on appeal, he's allowed to assert that. But we accept the verdicts of our criminal justice system. We accept the verdicts in our civil justice system. We accept um, our system to be fair. And if we don't like the results in a particular case, we can criticize the results in a particular case, but we don't attack the system. I mean, this is this is this should be just you know civics 101, and 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 kudos to this this woman for recognizing um, the basic truth, which is that we depend on this system and we need to support the system. And if Donald Trump is a criminal and he's convicted of a crime, well, then he's got to pay the price that everyone else would have to pay. You or I would be, you know, we would we would never have been gotten away with this, any of this. Yeah. Well, then there's the second genre, right. I would say, of comments that we got where people are like, yes, I'm glad he got convicted, but I don't think he'll do any jail time. I don't think, you know, they, they sort of felt like it would get soft pedal because yeah. of who he is. I, I mean, I, I, that's sort of a problem in terms of the corrosive effect that Trump has had on perceptions of our system of justice and the rule of law is that he gets away with everything. He's gotten away with everything his entire life. And the fact of the matter is it, that there, there is truth in that, but that's coming to an end. I mean, every time he is tested in a court of law, um, basically he comes out on the wrong end. I mean, he may get a few breaks here and there, and, and he, he may win a couple of things along the way, but most of the time he's getting hammered. He got hammered in that civil case involving his business to the tune of basically a half a billion dollars. He got hammered in the, the rape and defamation cases that E. Jean Carroll brought. And now he's been held, you know, his company was held uh, basically criminally liable uh, for its crimes. Um, and now he personally has been held criminally liable or will be held criminally liable, has been found to be convicted of 34 felonies. And in terms of whether or not he's going to do jail time, I think he will. I yeah. think ultimately he will if he if he's not elected president. I think it's going to be very difficult for this judge not to sentence Donald Trump to some jail time, and I, I understand that it, you know that he's he's not a violent offender and he's technically he's a first time offender. But you know this this man was held in contempt by this court ten times for violating court orders. He did nothing but flout flout the authority of the court. He has shown he has shown and he's going to absolutely show. Zero, zero acceptance of responsibility, zero remorse for the, for, for the crimes that he committed. And that all of those factors are going to weigh in favor of some jail time. I don't know that it's going to be, you know, four years, which is what you could have on any number, any one of these 34 counts. But, um, you know, he could, you could easily see him get in a year or two uh, on a, or even maybe more than that. Hey, let me ask you something about Marshawn. I, this is an, I, I, I forgot that I wanted to know this, but now that you're talking about him. One of the other things that came up was that this judge had given like a small amount of money to Democrats at some point. Is that so the Republicans are saying he should have recused himself. Is that right? No, because the, basically this was adjudicated. I mean, this was adjudicated by, you know, that he was the, the, they were they were he was warned about that. You know, I think the ultimate thing by the, by the whatever judicial conduct authority there is, but he wasn't found to engage in, a, in an intentional violation. And it was a small amount of money. And the fact of the matter is, it, it, you know, he, he conducted this trial with impeccable fairness. So I, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't see how he could have conducted the trial more fairly and frank. I, I think he gave the guy a break. I, I probably would have thrown the guy in jail for, for some of those contempt violations, at least let him sit in a holding tank for a few hours. I know hours. you would have. Hey, speaking of that, so, uh, Trump's lawyers are asking Marshawn to lift Trump's gag order, saying there's nothing to justify continued restrictions on the First Amendment rights of, of President Trump and that Trump is entitled to unrestrained campaign activity. What do you think he's going to do? Well, I think it may well be that at this point the restrictions on commenting on witnesses may be lifted. Again, I, I haven't studied what the First Amendment law on this is, but I, I, have, I have a feeling that what it would a, a reasonable result here would be, okay, he can, he can start trashing on Michael Cohen if he wants to do it again because there's no danger. You know, I mean, conceivably, there could be a retrial if, if somehow he wins on appeal, but that's pretty remote. Um, he can start trashing on witnesses again, but he cannot trash on the jurors. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's the thing I would be most concerned with because you know we cannot have a system where 
um, jurors are subjected to retribution by the mob yeah. incited by a criminal. Yeah. And, you know, so I, so I think there are going to be some restrictions that remain. We know Trump loves retribution. OK. And then speaking of Trump, so he's also complaining about the sentencing e in July, that that's what's happening because it's happening right before <sighs> convention, like days before. Oh. But they asked for that date originally. Uh, literally, if you go through the transcript, they said, you know, we think somewhere early to mid-July would be best, Your Honor. They literally said that to him. And he basically said, OK, July 11th. I, I don't I don't know what their complaint is. I mean, it's literally his lawyers did that in front of of the judge and with Donald Trump sitting there at council table he could have he could have reached over to his lawyer who was at the podium he sat he sat next to where the lawyer was on the podium he could have grabbed him and said no 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 he didn't do that would he's just do you think they move he's just it? up what would they move it now would they do no, the same it's thing? Done. It's no it's done, done. it's They're done it. It, it, no he's just a pathological liar he lies you know he lied about he lied about that about you know that that it was done for political effect, even though his lawyers basically asked for that date, he lied about the temperature in the courtroom. As we might right. lied about the about the security outside the courtroom. He just spouts out lies. I mean, it just it, there is no there is there is no untruth that he will not spout out if it just occurs to him at a given moment that it's helpful to say something. You know what is not a lie? That perfect genes are oh. great. Many people are saying this. Many people are Many saying people. our sponsor today is one of your favorites. It is the perfect jean. The perfect jean makes great looking, perfect fitting jeans that are as comfortable as sweatpants. Is that true? They're comfortable yes, as sweatpants? Yes, these are extreme. I'm wearing them right now and they're very, they're very comfortable. Nice. Oh, this they feel the, great. Yeah, Look at that. Yeah, this, yeah. Look how stretchy. Yeah, they are stretchy. With six different fits, waist sizes from 26 to 50 and lengths from 26 to 38, the perfect jean has every type of body covered. You have a pair, George. How do you like them? I have multiple pairs. I have like three or four now. They keep sending them to you, huh? No. I mean, I got one free pair. And then you bought one? I think I should have gotten like 10. But yeah. okay, you know, they gave me one. And then I ordered three or four more. So they made money off of me. Nice. Well, the Perfect Jean doesn't stop there, though. They've revolutionized t-shirts as well. The Perfect Tee is soft as butter without shrinking in the wash like all your other tees. It's just perfect. And they always have free shipping, exchanges, and returns, so you can have peace of mind knowing that your order is completely risk-free. For a limited time, our listeners get 15% off their first order plus free shipping at theperfectgene.nyc or Google the Perfect Gene and use code ASKGEORGE15 for 15% off. It's finally time to ditch uncomfortable jeans by going to theperfectgene.nyc. Our listeners get 15% off your first order plus free shipping, free returns, and free exchanges when you use code ASKGEORGE15 at checkout. That's 15% for new customers at theperfectgene.nyc with promo code ASKGEORGE15. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. F*** your khakis and get the perfect they gene. They do put that. The website does say, I say don't, f*** your khakis. I, yeah, yes, it does I, say that. F star parentheses K. Yes. Your khakis and get the perfect jean. Look, it's this is the look. It's perfect jeans NYC. Yeah, it's like you know this is this is New York language. There. Okay, well, okay? and the other reason why you should buy they're from New York, and we want to support New York. That people are saying that because of these convictions, all the business is going to go out in New York. That ain't true. Show them, show them, show them what's true by buying these perfect jeans. From New York. Okay, I'm just worried about all of our our young listeners. You know, our six and seven year old listeners who might. Well, you, you know, I language. That, you, yeah, Barry's gonna, a, gonna have Barry's to. Gonna believe Barry's us. gonna believe it. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. So, just very quickly, I want to run yeah. through the status of the other cases because mm. I do want to ask you about Eileen Cannon and the classified documents prosecution. <sighs> <laughs> so, as usual, Cannon's been ineptly shuffling everything around. Yeah. She had hearings scheduled for June 21st, 24th, and 25th. But this week she decided to order completely different hearings uh, on those days on completely different issues. So yeah. those hearings are now going to be about Trump's argument that Jack Smith was a legally appointed special counsel and about Jack Smith's gag order request. So whatever. Is this the same ineptitude and delay we've seen from Cannon throughout? Yes. <laughs> and and I don't even know where to start. I mean, the the whole bit about Jack Smith's appointment being unconstitutional. This is a bad argument that a friend of mine, actually, a longtime friend, maybe he doesn't consider me a friend, was Steve Calabresi, who was mm -hmm. one of the founders of the Federal Society, trotted out in 2017 to attack the Mueller investigation. And with allowing Amicus, Amici Curiae to participate, it's like, this should have been just denied in a 
five cent five five sentence order or five page opinion and already. The Amiki thing is that what it says uh, former attorneys general Ed Meese, Michael McCasey, and the Steve Calabresi, like no, they're no. allowed to submit and yeah, they're going to have a, they're going to have a law professor, I think, argue this for them, and they're going to make they're going to make arguments. But uh, you know, on the other hand, there are some people. I, I joined a brief, um, uh, uh, and and the person who signed that brief is going to argue against you know on, against the ridiculous arguments that that are being made to challenge the constitutionality of the special counsel. You know, but but it's just all it's just a, it's just a giant wasteful exercise on a frivolous issue, and this is part of. The program of delay that has essentially been imposed on this case. I mean, every little ca- every little issue that's raised, regardless of its merit, is getting this 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 extended, time consuming treatment. And I think it is a, you know I think it's a combination of incompetence and bias. I just can't explain it any other way. It's just mystifying to me. Yeah. So that's not going forward. Speaking of special counsels. Biden's DOJ is uh, currently trying Biden's sudden federal court in Delaware. It just You've been started. following any of that Hunter stuff? Not that closely. I mean, I just don't think it's really an important case for the republic except to demonstrate the good faith of prosecutors in the Justice Department. I mean, I think there are a lot of good arguments that, that you know, Hunter Biden shouldn't be prosecuted, that he's being prosecuted for something that typically isn't prosecuted, but the fact of the matter that this that this proceeding is being carried out without any intervention by a, the president of the United States, even by, either legally or in terms of just criticism, just shows you the difference between people who respect the law and respect the legal process and respect the rule of law against uh, versus the Trumpists who basically will attack it whenever they don't like the result. I mean, I can't imagine Joe Biden thinks it's fair that his son's being prosecuted by his, by the Department of Justice. And it's his Department of Justice under his attorney general. But you don't hear him attacking the prosecutors. You don't hear him saying it's a witch hunt. You don't see, hear him saying, oh, it's cold in the courtroom, my poor son. Yeah. I mean, you don't hear him saying any of that. And it, it, it just tells you, it shows you something. It shows you something that, um, and there are arguments, there are legitimate arguments that, as to why this prosecution should not have been brought but no, yeah, those, well, are, those are arguments think, for the court. Those are, those are arguments for the courts to decide. Here's one thing I think is probably true. It is probably true that Donald Trump, had he not been the president, would not have been tried for things like the Stormy Daniels hush money payment. And hold on. And, and then Hunter would likely not be being tried for this were his father not the president. But here's the thing. Donald Trump committed a lot of crimes. Correct. And then ran for president. Correct. Allow when you've made this point before that oftentimes or most of the time when you do lots of crimes, you don't run for higher office and engage in a lot right. more scrutiny because inviting that scrutiny. It's a bad uh, idea. Bad idea. Hunter Biden's dad ran for president. Yeah, well, I feel and, bad for him in that sense. And but look, I mean, the thing. I'm not uh, saying he's a great guy. I, I don't I'm think just saying, he okay, is, yeah, look, Do- Donald Trump, there may be things that Donald Trump wouldn't have been prosecuted for um, had he not run for public office. This, uh, But the fact of the matter is he's gotten away with a lot. Because he's held public office. Yeah. You cited as an example the, the state prosecution that he, where he was just convicted of 34 felonies. I mean, John Edwards was prosecuted. Yeah. For something very, very similar. There just was less evidence. And so the jury reached an acquittal on one count and then hung on all the other counts. And the reason why was because not, it wasn't because the legal theory was bad. I mean, he was basically, what happened was he took a, he, there was a bunch of money taken from this old rich lady to pay off. Real, Real Hunter, Hunter, speaking of Hunters, um, who was John Edwards' baby mama, you know that 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 case went down because there just wasn't enough evidence. The woman who gave the money was like non copus mentis. He was like a hundred years old, and they didn't have a paper trail the way they had for Trump. But also, Democrats w- ended his career. He was done it after did that. End, right? right? And, Nobody and, and would touch that, that guy. That, Edwards, after the partial acquittal and hung jury, took responsibility. Said, "I shouldn't have done that. That was bad judgment. It was terrible." And I, I accept responsibility for what I did what was wrong, which is one of the re- I think that was probably one of the reasons why he wasn't prosecuted again. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it's just a, a remarkable contrast where you have basically one political party that cares nothing about the system, cares nothing about the law, cares nothing about the Constitution, cares nothing about justice, but only cares about supporting one man who is irretrievably 
demented and depraved and is now a convicted felon in addition to being an adjudicated rapist and fraudster. And they do it all while wrapping themselves in the flag and waving the Constitution around as though Ugh. they're defending it. Okay, let's move on to Georgia. You got me started again. I know, I know, I know. We just have, we almost are through. Okay. So uh, as a reminder, folks, the Georgia election interference prosecution is on hold while an appellate court reviews the Fonnie Willis disqualification question. This week, the appellate court said uh, that oral argument would tentatively be scheduled for October 4th. So that's like, that's it. It's yeah, like no, DOA, that, that, right? that case was D, has been DOA for a while in terms of whether or not it would be, pro, it would be tried in, in 2024. I, I still think that there isn't a, a substantial basis to conclude that in any way that the defendants were prejudiced by this unfortunate brouhaha about Bonnie Willis and her ex, her ex boyfriend and ex co prosecutor. And I, you know, I, again, as I've, I've said, we've had this discussion before. It was just not a good idea by Bonnie Willis. And she should have owned up to it immediately and gotten rid of the guy and said, no harm, no foul. But she just made it worse for herself. And this is the price that we're paying is, is this delay. It was just a, a, the price that we're paying for, frankly, her bad judgment is, you know, the delay of, of, of the cause of justice. I think in the end, the case will get tried. I think they'll, they should win the appeal. Maybe it'll go up to the Georgia Supreme Court. I don't know. But there's... You know, these were these are serious crimes under Georgia law. The the grand jury so found um, they were this was an attempt to basically steal Georgia's 16 electoral votes through lies and intimidation and fraud. And you now the notion that it that it, it is being held up because of this completely unnecessary missteps and misjudgments, um, I think is is greatly unfortunate. And you know, I don't mean to come down too hard on Fonnie Willis because I think I, I think she does a lot of credit for her courage in s stepping forward and bringing the case but man what a what a what an own goal yeah uh and just as we wrap up the January 6th election interference prosecution in DC is on hold pending a decision from the Supreme Court on whether Trump is immune from prosecution and we're going to get that opinion sometime this month yeah probably I, I suspect the last day of the term June 25th or so Okay, we'll talk about it then. George, as always, thanks for explaining the legal news to me and our listeners. Don't forget to hit subscribe. Leave us a review on your podcast app. Email us at askgeorge at thebulwark.com, and we will see you next week. Well, George Conway, he's a man with a plan. Got to sit down with Sarah Longwell, take a stand, explain all the legal problems they're piling high. With Donald Trump, oh my, oh my, oh my. He said, Sarah, let me break it down for you. There's obstruction of justice, corruption to the legal tangles and troubles that are growing fast. It's a storm that's gonna last and last. Oh, Conway, tell on well about it. Those legal problems can't live without it. From the Ebola mess to the Russian ties. Listen close